and Volusia Forever. The League supported these programs not only in the last election, but also 20 years ago. We have always understood the value of these programs to our community, and we want them to be successful for another 20 years. To that end, tonight we will outline what happens next, including how projects are submitted and how they are evaluated for funding. We want as many people as possible to understand the historic and factual background of ECHO and Volusia Forever in order to lay the groundwork for educated input into, the, uh, into Volusia County's upcoming listening sessions. Those listening sessions will be your chance to ask about policies and implementation that will be used in these programs. All of our speakers tonight were active members in the ECHO Volusia Forever PAC and Alliance who worked many months to advocate for these initiatives and were instrumental in their passage. Our first speaker is Clay Henderson. Uh, he, Clay Henderson is a leading environmental lawyer, educator, and writer. He has long been engaged in environmental policy in Florida. Until his retirement in 2019, he served as executive director for the Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience at Stetson University with a faculty appointment to the College of Law. Previously, he served as senior counsel at the national law firm of Holland and Knight, practicing public policy and environmental law. He also served as president of Florida Audubon Society, president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, and was elected to two terms on the Volusia County Council. Mr. Henderson is most associated with wildlife and land conservation. He served on the 1998 Florida Constitution Revision Commission and sponsored most of the environmental provisions in Florida's constitution, including the creation of Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. He co-authored the Florida Land and Water Legacy in Initiative, the largest conservation funding program in our nation's history, ratified in 2014. He was also a leader in the development of Florida's signature land acquisition programs, including Preservation 2000, Florida Forever, and Florida Communities Trust, and negotiated the acquisition of over 300,000 acres of conservation lands, which are now part of national and state parks, forests, and wildlife refuges. Kelly McGee, who, will be, who has joined us, hi Kelly, um, is Executive Director of the Riverside Conservancy, a nonprofit organization that promotes living shoreline restoration and other nature-based solutions to improve water quality and aquatic habitat. Ms. McGee has written and implemented federal and local laws, drafted congressional testimony, and testified in multiple judicial hearings as a natural resources expert. She previously served Volusia County as Director of Growth and Resource Management, Director of Planning and Development and Services, and Natural Resources Director. Nancy Maddox is Recreation and is Recreation and Economic Development Director for the City of Daytona Beach Shores and a lifetime resident of New Smyrna Beach. Mrs. Maddox has served on many boards, including the Florida Historical Commission, President of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, co-chair of the Volusia Flagler United Way Women's Initiative and mentor for Take Stock and Children. Having worked in many capacities while she was with Parks, Recreation and Culture Division of the County of Volusia, and then later the Leisure Services Director for the City of New Smyrna Beach, Nancy has a broad knowledge and experience in various diverse disciplines and holds a Master of Public Administration from the University of Central Florida. Her personal commitment as both an advocate and a connector has enhanced the lives of Volusia County residents in the realms of environmental, cultural, historic, and recreational facilities and programs. <clears throat> Longtime Volusia County resident Pat Northey has served for 20 years as a Volusia County Council member. During her tenure, she, spoke, she spent much of her time working to improve Volusia, Volusia's quality of life. An early and ardent supporter of the 2000 Volusia Forever and Echo initiatives, Mrs. Northey now serves as council member Fred Lowry's appointee appointment to the Echo Committee. Pat recently chaired the successful Echo Volusia Forever PAC to reauthorize the two 20-year-old initiatives for another 20 years. 
Pat was also instrumental in the development of the county's extensive recreational trail system while serving on the county council. She currently serves on the board of directors for the River to Sea Loop Alliance, where she advocates for the creation of a 260 mile loop trail through five counties, providing an off-road bicycling experience for all. Pat is currently vice chair of the Volusia Echo Committee and looks forward to the next 20 years of echo efforts in improving the quality of life for all of Volusia. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Clay Henderson. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And first question is, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, then now the next, let's try to uh, get the PowerPoint up. Share. And is that up? We good? All right. Well, we'll get we'll get rolling through here. So very nice to uh, be able to do this virtually, and look forward to a day in the near future when we can do these things in a you know in a same room. Uh, it's nice to be uh, again with my colleagues uh, Nancy and uh, Kelly and Pat, uh, who are very experienced in all these matters, and look forward to hearing everything they have to say. Uh, but most importantly, we're grateful to the League of Women Voters for um, so for their long-term participation and leadership in this issue. Uh, they were involved in each of the uh, referenda uh, that we've had uh, on these subjects in 86 and 2000 and, and late, and have truly been leaders and champions in, in quality of life uh, issues uh, in this county uh, over their long history. Um, we're here tonight, uh, this first part, to talk about the Volusia Forever program, and then Pat and Nancy will follow uh, with a discussion about uh, Forever. Uh, first, uh, 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 and, and first we'll have again some more thanks, and so I think I hear Kelly has joined. I don't see her, but I know she's on here. Kelly, I'm this here. is your slide. I'm here. Yeah, so thank you, Clay, and, and thank you, um, all for inviting me to participate. Um, and of course, we want to thank the Volusia County voters. You know, we wouldn't be here talking about Volusia forever and echo if the voters hadn't overwhelmingly supported these programs um, last November. And um, we were doing this session in the hopes that people will participate in the county's upcoming listening sessions. Each advisory board is going to have a series of listening sessions and um you know this this started the county council wanted um volusia forever and echo to be a grassroots initiative and that's exactly what um the alliance did created a, a vast network a grassroots network and and now the county council wants to hear what the voters want to accomplish with these programs for the next 20 years so um, we are going to go through these slides and we have some, some recommendations that if you are um, watching this webinar, um, we ask that you please attend at least one of the listening sessions for Volusia Forever and Echo. And um, we have lots of recommendations, but um, to sum up the, the recommendations, um, we, uh, we see that there's really good promise in fulfilling our long range conservation planning efforts. Um, by acquiring lands and easements in the conservation corridor, filling gaps in parkland, um, acquiring easements to farmland to keep those farmers farming, and um, to protect water resources, which can include things like shoreline and springs protection. Clay? All right. Um, so let's see. Let's just to bring you up to date on where we are and where the process is. As we know, the uh, voters approved this in November. Uh, we asked the county council to uh, uh, make an early appointment of the advisory board and to set up listing sessions. They have done that. They have appointed an advisory board and listing sessions have been scheduled for April and May. Uh, that board will uh, recommend procedures to be adopted to the county council. And this will all take effect after that. Uh, since this is a, in fact, a continuation of the old tax levy. Um, the monies are not actually available until next year. So they can get all this stuff uh, prepared in anticipation of that. And uh, uh, well, that's a good part of what this process is, is educating people about the process so they can go forward. I've got a link here, which is where you'd find information on the, on the upcoming hearings and uh, on any additional information on Volusia Forever. 
th this is a long link. If you just really just Google uh, Volusia Forever, it will all come up and it will all be there. That's the easiest way to do it. That's how I do it. Uh, here is the schedule. Uh, there is going to be one listing session in each of the five county council member uh, di member districts beginning in late April and continuing uh, until mid uh, May. And, and we would ask you to put at least one of these on your calendar and attend and speak up for protecting the integrity uh, of this program. Just a quick uh, history of this, we can all pat ourselves on the back because uh, we're part of uh, a great history and tradition here. We were the first in the nation to approve an environmental endangered lands program in 1986. We didn't know we were the first in the nation. It just seemed like a very practical thing to do. We needed to get some money ahead of the bulldozer to buy up some incredibly beautiful lands uh, uh, in, in advance of the massive development that we were seeing. Uh, in 2000, uh, we put together a more ambitious program that lasted for 20 years. And then again, uh, we reauthorized this in November. So we're one of just a very few jurisdictions in the entire country that have done this uh, three times. And then, you know, four or five, if you count ECHO, uh, you know, once or twice, because that's unusual as well. Uh, we kicked it off in 86. Just uh, it's a Look at the list of these parks. Uh, these were places that uh, we were able to acquire under that program, uh, places that I hope that you get to enjoy uh, um, and some of the addition of state parks as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a great legacy that uh, we were able to do that. Um, we came back again in uh, 2000 and approved the original program. Uh, the 20, 0.2 mills for 20 years, it raised about $68 million. So that's more than three times what we had for the original uh, program. Um, did not acquire as much land uh, as the first program, but that's because of the huge spike in property values during this period of time. Um, and, and, and by this time, there were also more local governments out there doing the same thing, learning from what we did in Volusia County. But what they were able to do in that 20-year program was really get the Volusia Conservation uh, Corridor going to mostly get Spruce Creek Preserve acquired and pick up some other beautiful places like Thornby or Green Springs. And uh, these are uh, places that I know many of you uh, enjoy. It's as part of our overall quality of life. They did a good job of piecing that uh, together. Um, it has been an award-winning program. It's received both state and national um, uh, attention and, and, and recognition. Uh, and again, that, as Kelly says, this goes right back to the voters. Uh, the voters made this possible and um, we should continue this legacy. Um, we've given some thought to, uh, to this and I, I could speak for the whole hour on it, but I'm obviously not going to, but, but just to, to highlight the, the, the keys to success. I mean, we started it, we built upon the success and going forward, these are gonna be the touchstones for whether it will be a success. First of all, procedures. I mean, I know there's nothing more, more boring than procedures, but procedures make sure that you're buying the best of the best, that you're not paying too much for the property, that it's free from political influence, and that it's part of an overall plan, and you're not just reacting to the, the next little thing that comes along. Pro process is protects the integrity of the program. The second is just as key, and that's keeping it free from political influences. There have been, you know, county commissions in other parts of the state where people have been indicted for their involvement in land deals. You don't ever want to see that happen. You, you want to see the process work through in, in a professional and independent way. You don't want to have county council members out negotiating deals. That's just, that, that, that's not a recipe for success. Third, working with national conservation organizations, we'll mention this a little bit later, but that those people have far more experience than anyone in the county. Nature Conservancy, Trust, Public Land, Conservation Fund, they do this all the time. They know how to facilitate partnerships, they know how to work with landowners, they know how to do tax deals. Partnering is so important to have more bang for the buck, working with Florida Forever Program, water management districts, and also our individual uh, cities. 
creative financing is something that can be done not just through bonding, but through tax incentives and other things working with landowners. Conservation easements, you don't have to buy the entire property. You just may, in some many cases, particularly with agricultural lands, forestry lands, just simply buy the development rights. And bonding, we think it's important now with, with interest rates low to be able to borrow this money in advance. Um, the acquisition process, the property is nominated, county staff reviews, it goes to the advisory committee, which looks at the criteria that Kelly is going to explain, and then the county council uh, makes, its, uh, makes its decisions on going forward. Um, and ha it has to be uh, done with appraisals that are independent, and usually they're off of the, the state, ac state acquisition list of certified appraisers. Kelly, take it up from here. All right. Thank you, Clay. So, you know, these programs um, didn't operate um, in a vacuum and they didn't operate on a sort of ad hoc piecemeal basis. Um, the, the folks who put these programs together um, really knew how to work with the state and other entities to, to leverage funding. And um, that's one thing that we are, we're really encouraging um, the, the county to continue to do is to really get the most bang for your buck. So if you can, uh, if the county can use Volusia Forever funding um, and use it to match uh, Florida Forever funding, right? Right there, you've doubled your money and we've brought those resources into Volusia County um, from Tallahassee. And so there's some criteria that are, you know, I think pretty scientifically well based and make a lot of sense logically. Um, proximity and connectivity. You can see this map. Um, the, the the conservation corridor runs down the middle of the county, and in this map, you're going you're just seeing the properties that have actually been acquired. Um, we have several wildlife corridors throughout the county, um, and uh, the, for example, the black bears uh, tend to follow the river on the western and su southwestern portions of the county. We've got the conservation corridor, which is a relatively high um, altitude, um, relatively flat and wet. So there's a lot of sheet flow, right? And so those are ecologically connected lands. Um, and there's a lot of agricultural lands there. And of course, our coastal areas um, are, are wildlife corridors as well. So we have concert, we have corridors that are connected by land. You can physically walk from one property to the next um, without it being interrupted. Um, land, sea, and air. Um, we, we, um, we actually have habitats that are connected by birds um, that need, um, that literally hop over parts of land to find habitat. Um, so, so the criteria, you know, is, is, it, is it connected some way, land, sea, or air? Will it maintain that ecological link? Um, and uh, will it further the prior acquisition efforts? There's a lot of programs that have identified lands that are high priority under threat from development or um, other, other impacts. Um, and so um, there is a reasonable expectation of matching funds with these properties, again, to leverage it. Next slide, please. And here's an example of the Florida scrub jay um, is endemic to Florida, meaning that he is found nowhere else. Um, only in Florida. And this is one of those critters that needs uh, con ecological connectivity by air. Um, they need patches of dry, well-drained, um, sandy soil, scrub habitat. Um, and those are prime for development. And so um, that could be a uh, uh, that could elevate a property in terms of priority and the selection criteria. If there are environmentally sensitive lands like scrub habitat with um, families of scrub jays, um, those could be really good potential targets um, to maintain those remaining populations of um, federally or state listed um, species. And 
you know, um, the acreage really that is needed depends upon the resources that you're trying to protect. The scrub jay family needs about 25 acres, um, and, and but they can functionally use acreage of less than 25 acres to hop to the next 25 acre property that is good habitat. And so you need these little pockets, um, but you do need that connectivity. And again, um, protecting our fragile coastal resources. We do have coastal scrub jays and we have a lot of other animals that um, use our coastal, our riverine, our estuarine um, areas for, for habitat um, and as part of their, um, you know, their annual migrations. Next slide, please. Water resources. So, you know, um, there was a, a big emphasis on protecting our water quality and quantity. And uh, we can do that through the Volusia Forever selection process um, by prioritizing um, lands that serve an important groundwater recharge function. Um, if the land, for example, contains um, a water body or um, a wetland, it might be a high priority. If it contains a springs or a buffer around a spring, um, you know, there's many different ways that water resources can be conserved through the acquisition of the lands completely or a conservation easement like um, shoreline conservation easements where we would have a green buffer along the waterway or the spring um, and, and protect our, our the quantity for our, of our potable water as well as the quality. Next slide, please. Um, management. So buying it is just the first step. You know, we have to manage these properties in perpetuity. And so this is another um, place that it would be really helpful to have organizations like uh, the Trust for Public Lands come in and talk about best management practices um, and, you know, use that as a selection criteria. If there is uh, land that is really cost effective to manage, um, that might actually be a, a really good buy. Um, for example, if it's already existing, um, if it's adjacent to existing conservation habitats, if it has good access, um, if there, if the wetlands are in pristine condition, well, then that's that's perfect, right? You won't have to do much. Um, same things if you've got if you've got scrub habitat uplands. Um, that are good viable scrub jay habitat, you might just need regular maintenance, not a complete overhaul of the ecosystem. Next slide, please. And um, remembering, you know, resource-based recreation lands. So, you know, these, these greenways and blue ways, these paddling trails, um, these are all ways that the public can enjoy are, are natural spaces. Um, and right here, this photograph is, I believe that is in uh, the Lyony Preserve with the scrub jay. And, um, you know, they are very, <laughs> they're very friendly. They rely on open sandy areas as well as scrub, scrub trees, scrub habitats. And so um, knowing that these lands provide great recreation for the public, especially now that everybody's getting outside um, because of COVID um, and we're trying to limit our, our indoor enclosed um, time, uh, you know, we, we really value these, these resource-based recreation lands. Next slide, please. Clay, back to you. Okay, so I alluded to this earlier, you know, we have a lot of other programs out there. It's gonna be important to work with these as, as partners. Uh, each of these agencies have their own criteria and their own mission, but there's a lot of overlap. The district is mostly interested in water resources, uh, and, we, and so are we. Uh, the Forestry Service uh, is in, in interested in expanding their um, uh, forestry holdings, and uh, that is consistent with what we would like to do with the corridor, as an example. Florida Communities Trust has been worked really well with cities. I think uh, over 20, there've been, I think there's been over 20 uh, grants given to county and cities in the county for various uh, projects. So the partners are there. We just have to build the relationships and come to the table and find the things that uh, bring us together. I mentioned the conservation organizations earlier. They're so important because of their experience 
their ability to work with landowners, their understanding of uh, tax consequences of some of these sales and how you can provide work incentives into the program. And sometimes you just need um, a third party, you know, to uh, to bring it together. Not everybody, uh, you know, trusts dealing with the government, for instance. So uh, these do a great job. We've also got some really good uh, statewide and regional land trusts in the area, and all of them uh, have uh, can bring a lot to the table. Um, the money that's out there, we have to pay attention to it because it, it's the legislature's in session and they it gets political and it changes from year to year. Um, Amendment 1 passed in 2014. It's going to raise over $20 billion. The legislature has been fairly inconsistent with the expenditures or appropriations, but there's some things they have done. They've provided $50 million a year for springs projects. And of course, we've got springs in this county. And it's not just for purchasing springs, but buffer areas around them. There's currently $100 million in the Florida Forever Trust Fund. The legislature uh, working through the appropriations process. I understand there's 50 million in the Senate side. That's what the governor's asking. The House has 100 million. So it's going to be funded this year. Uh, whether rural family lands or communities trust is funded, we'll have to stay on top of. One thing we do know is there's new federal money out there. At the end of last year, Congress passed the Great American Outdoors Act. There's going to be close to a billion dollars available in grants to local governments. And so we need to stay on top of that uh, as well. As we've said throughout this, and it'd be a continuing theme, you know, the best bang for the buck is to complete the projects that are out there. And you can see from this slide how the connections are all kind of coming together. The Big Florida Forever projects are the Conservation Corridor, Spruce Creek, Indian River Blue Way. And just I'm going to breeze through these. I think we're going to need to probably put this slide up on our website so people can come back to these maps. But this shows that even for all the great things we've done with the Conservation Corps, there's still about 17,000 acres out there still to be acquired. And it doesn't have to be bought outright. Most of this can be done with conservation easements. But it's all connected as we start, and that's great. And it's just a wonderful thing if we could complete this. It would mean, for instance, that East Volusia and West Volusia would not grow together in one great big urban sprawl. And that's reason enough to do it. Uh, providing buffers around our springs. Uh, it would be so critical to Delian Springs in particular and Blue Spring because uh, there are areas that still can be acquired that will help uh, with the water quality of these springs. The, um, the, one of the big successes of the two programs was the creation and expansion of these three state parks, but they're up in uh, the Tomoka Basin area. But as you can see, there's still some inholdings there and it'd be great to be able to work with the state to be able to, to optimize the boundaries of these state parks and make this a, a true, um, uh, you know, a crowning achievement for this part of the county and, and, and really for the state. Um, there's still a few uh, opportunities in Spruce Creek. I, I consider it essentially complete. It is, but there are a few parcels that are left to be done and, and you know, we can, we can and should uh, complete it. Uh, in the Indian River Lagoon, I mean, most of the big parcels have been acquired, but there's going to be a need to do some shoreline buffers. And, and Kelly, I'll let you pick up on this, and then the conservation easement slide follows this. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, as Clay mentioned, you know, there's one uh, one approach is to buy as much acreage as possible. Um, really difficult to do uh, in coastal areas, and so something that we've been looking at is creating conservation easements on shoreline. So you might have um, property owners who have a building or a house on, on waterfront property. Um, there is every reason, uh, multiple reasons why these shorelines could have a conservation easement and be planted, maintained in living shoreline, which improves water quality, um, prevents pollution from running off into the water, provides habitat for our commercial and recreational fish species, and it also provides habitat for about 14 endangered species um, in the Indian River Lagoon. So buffers for shorelines um, could be um, a fairly easy win. Next slide. And this is yours. Yep, yep. So um, the Environmental Corps Overlay, just wanted to talk about connectivity here. Um, the the, the Smart Growth Committee back in 2004, 2005, uh, created a, 
uh, basically a manual on how do we get to smart growth and protecting the environmental core was the number one keystone priority. And so the um, county and the cities came together through the um, Volusia Council of Governments and negotiated, it took over a year to negotiate this map um, that was designed using existing um, already purchased public lands and then mapping the most critical um, wildlife habitat um, corridors together so that you can get the east connected with um, the middle connected with the west side of the county. And so this map is really the bare minimum that we need to maintain um, to maintain ecological integrity of Volusia County. So we would we would ask the listening, um, the, the advisory boards during their listening sessions to look at all of these maps that have been done so that um, these acquisitions can be done in a, a really targeted and thoughtful way. Next slide. And we may have covered all this, but the, but the easement is the way to protect a piece of property in perpetuity by acquisition of its development rights the owner remains in possession to manage and use good stewardship. And that's a great thing for both ag and forestry uh, because you, know, you don't want the county to be, the county's not gonna be in the farming business, uh, but this keeps the landowner in possession and yet protects the property from being developed. Um, we'll wrap up here that financing, as we mentioned earlier, it's gonna, uh, the Avalorum tax will continue. We think that this is a apt time to go forward with bond issue for a good bit of it. We're growing back at a fast rate. State is going at a thousand people a day. Bond rates or interest rates are the lowest they've been for years. So this would be a good way to get more bang for the buck. Uh, the next steps in this, as we said all along, you know, the, we've got the whole advisory the, the sessions. We urge everybody to go. Resolutions will be adopted as the board of the county, and, and the resolutions or the procedures will be uh, adopted. And then, lastly, this is our, our alliance, our coalition has kept our website up. We're going to be adding uh, this presentation, our white paper, other things yeah, as we go, so you can come back to this as a handy, handy reference. So with that, and I think we've, we've been a little better on time this time than last time, I'm going to stop the share and we'll move on to thank Kelly and we'll move on to Echo. Okay. It's not letting me share. Oh, there we go. work. Yay, it worked. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again, Nancy and the League, for having us. Um, and it's an honor to be part of this esteemed panel. Thank you to all who voted for these amazing programs, as Kelly had said earlier. But without you, we wouldn't be able to create this legacy that we're creating for our county. Uh oh. Yeah, it's not. It's the screen soft went off. It went off? Yeah, can't see it. Okay, let me try it again. Sorry, everyone. It worked earlier. There we go. Okay. Let's start it from the beginning. Is it there? No? no. I keep I'm so sorry. Right. Nancy, can you just share it that way instead of clicking slideshow because it's up? Thanks. So. Just be able to go this way. 
yeah. um, as opposed to doing slideshow, that seems to be where it wants to disappear. <laughs> okay, we'll do it this way. All right. All right, so uh, Volusia Echo, um, it's a, the grant is to provide funds to finance acquisition, restoration, construction or improvement of facilities to be used for environmental, cultural, historical or outdoor recreation purposes that must be open for the public. Currently there are 241 projects throughout the county. Um, if you Google Volusia Echo, um, they have a great website. You can go on this map and check out all the um, different projects that have been funded so far. And ECHO seeks to enhance the quality of life of Volusia County's residents um, to achieve goals over a broad geographical base. Some of the examples of environmental cultural centers are the Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet and the Marine Discovery Center in New Smyrna Beach. Um, and I, you saw pictures of the Lyonia Preserve. Well, attached to that is the environmental, Lyonia Environmental Learning Center. Um, in Deltona. It's also to improve the quality of life for Volusia citizens by providing access to the cultural arts. Um, for example, the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach, uh, a world-renowned um, facility, African American Museum Cultural Center and Amphitheater in Deland, Bethune-Cookman University Performing Arts Center in Daytona Beach, and Gateway Center for the Arts in DeBerry. ECHO preserves significant archeological and historic resources throughout the county, like the Athens Theater in DeLand, DeBerry Hall Historic Site in DeBerry, um, Dunlot and Sugar Mill Historic Site in Port Orange, and the Village Improvement Center Association Building in Oak Hill. It provides high quality, user-oriented outdoor recreational, recreational opportunities including Andy Romano Beachfront Park in Ormond, Green Springs Park in Enterprise, our original county seat, Beck Ranch in Osteen, and Seville Soccer Field and Neighborhood Park. There are three steps um, in the ECHO process. The first, the organization and application must demonstrate eligibility before it is submitted to the ECHO Advisory Committee. And once the advisory committee reviews and scores the grant, the application must receive a minimum of score of 80. Um, and then as, when, as there are the review panel in order to be recommended for funding to the county council. And thirdly, the project must be approved for a grant by official action of the county council. Applicants must attend a, a mandatory workshop prior to submitting a grant application and grant applications are only accepted at a specific time of year. Applicants who qualify are Volusia County government, municipal government within Volusia County or not-for-profit corporations that meet criteria. Exceptional grants um, projects means a project of paramount and crucial countywide importance, which provides services to large numbers of people in all areas of the county, as demonstrated and determined by a three-fourths majority of the ECHO Committee and a majority of the County Council. The exceptional grant applicant may request up to 600,000 annually for up to three consecutive years, and the applicant must provide a four to one match. Some examples of um, exceptional grants have been Earl Brown Park and Speck Martin Stadium in DeLand, the Ocean Center in Daytona, the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach. And no project or facility complex may receive more than one exceptional grant award through the life of the ECHO program. Another type of grant that ECHO provides is a critical historic acquisition and or stabilization application. And it's used solely to finance the acquisition and or stabilization of historically designated sites to determine to be endangered 
by immediate development, elimination of process access and or structural conditions that are recently and unexpectedly revealed, including projects being neglected in order to access demolition permits. And unlike the other grant process, applications for this grant are accepted all year round. Some examples are Lily in Place, um, the acquisition of it, Underhill House, Pioneer Arts Settlement, um, a stabilization grant, and the AME Church in Deland was another stabilization grant. There are three steps in this process. The application, applicant organization must be eligible and um, the application and um, the ECHO Advisory Committee will then review the application and make a recommendation to the County Council. And finally, the project must be approved by an official action of the County Council. Next, we're gonna talk about trails. I'm not gonna talk about trails because the queen of trails is with us this evening. Um, so Ms. Norby, um, you're up. Thank you, Nancy, and I'll ask you to advance the slides as needed. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. So I, I hope that most of you have had the opportunity to go out onto the county showcase multi-trail system. It's pretty significant and uh, far reaching from, gosh, to Leon Springs all the way over to Edgewater, New Smyrna Beach. A million dollars a year was set aside early on in the program for uh, 20 million amount of dollars that were then uh, bonded so that they could build the trails and get, get them on the ground faster. We, we have about 70 miles on the ground now. Uh, and, and that trail, as I said earlier, connects from, Edge, from Leon Springs to Edgewater. There is a, a piece that goes down into Titusville. So we actually, we actually meet Brevard County. They have part of, of that trail as well. Uh, most of it is on the East Coast Regional Rail Trail, an abandoned, abandoned rail line. And of course, um, there's a few places that are still not completed, but we're working on it. Next slide. So we've, um, I serve on the ECHO board and uh, last year we made some recommendations to the ECHO guidebook that will be before the council, I believe after the listening sessions are completed, then they'll it'll go to council for their consideration. And, and we think they're, they're pretty significant. So I'm going to go over them with you. We believe that after 20 years, it's appropriate to increase the standard grant award from 400K to 600K. Uh, cost of everything has gone up. And so we think that that's appropriate for the next iteration. A uh, we want to increase the exceptional grant award from 1.8 million to 2 million over a three year period. And that again is an increase the, uh, for the next uh, recommended increase for the next 20 years. Uh, there was lots of discussion about match requirement on the exceptional grant awards. And it used to be a four to one match for every dollar echo put in there was four of a uh, 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 private or public, whichever whichever was doing it. But now we wanna to go to a one-to-one -one match that, that matches pretty much what ECHO is now. Um, and reduce, this is, a, this is a big one. This is one that we have had a lot of questions about and a lot of concerns over the course of the last 20 years for the program where uh, there was some complaints, some concerns that government, be it Volusia County or the cities, we're taking the majority of the money to use for uh, recreation, outdoor activities, for their own historic preservation. And, and that's true. And I, and I want to say there that those are always open. Part of the, part of the program and ECHO is that they have to be open to the public. So um, those programs, those projects that Volusia County did and the cities did are all, were all good projects that made it through the process. They were legitimate, but there was some concern by the different not-for-profit organizations that they, they had difficulty raising their cash match. And so we're looking to reduce the percentage of the cash match required for not-for-profit organizations. And it's kind of a sliding scale that if the council adopts that it depends on the revenue for the uh, for the particular not-for-profit, how much their, their uh, 
percent will be required and we're hoping that the council will adopt that one that's an important one and then finally um we have an, a number of applicants particularly with some of the cities that have uh, more than three open projects at one time and that's a lot to manage for a city to manage or for the county to manage and so we're going to recommend we did recommend that an applicant may only have three open projects at one time those are all proposed changes to the echo guidebook that will come to the council after this uh after the listening sessions and when they uh redo implementation language next slide Next slide. <laughs> okay, uh, these are your Volusia County ECHO committee members. Uh, Gerard Pendergast is from District 3. He's the chair. I serve as district, I serve as vice chair from District 5. Reggie Santilli is in Deland. Sarah Lee Morrissey, I believe, is Port Archer, Deland, or um, uh, Daytona. Pat Patterson, a former council member, Pat Patterson was appointed. He represents uh, the, the at-large, he represents Ben Johnson's at-large uh, area. And Jeffrey Alt, Jeffrey is a returning member, not from this last group, but Jeffrey was on ECHO some years ago, so he's excited to get back on. Jack Surratt is a returning uh, member uh, from the Ormond area, Stacy Simmons, and then David Romeo. Uh, I think they're all from the northeast section of this of the county, and um, there we're looking forward. We have our meeting, our first meeting of this new group will be April one, and it will be uh, we'll be doing a lot on sunshine and public records and t talking about the the loop project up in northeast uh, Volusia. Just just to point out, we we have looked at. When you look at the previous breakdown of ECHO projects, they're, they've been pretty much throughout the county uh, equally based um, as far as the elements of ECHO. Historic preservation has probably been the, the one that most, at least the money has been spent on. So uh, we're going to try to fix some of that in the next, in the next 20 years. So I think that's it for my slides, Nancy. Oh, listening sessions. I'm sorry. Yes, just like uh, Volusia Forever, there will be five listening sessions. They will be separate from Volusia Forever. So if you're interested, uh, the list is here. You can find it on the on the web. There will be a session for each district. And I would ex I would tell you, please attend if you can. It's my understanding they're also going to be available by either Zoom or Facebook Live. I'm not sure which one, but they you can view it over the internet, but it's really important that if you have some thoughts about Volusia Forever or Echo, Volusia Echo, and how you would like to see them operate in the next 20 years, this is your chance to speak up. We look forward to participating in that as, uh, as the Alliance, as the Echo Volusia Forever Alliance. Okay, so I think we're, we're all ready for questions now. So I guess right, very good. Um, I am going to get us started off. I have a couple of questions here. First of all, I want to welcome um, David Romeo and Sara Lee Morrissey. We're happy to have you on board today um, to new ECHO committee members. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I will start off with a question that is um, Volusia Forever. So this is a topic Clay touched upon earlier. Um, so in the panelists' experience, what were the elements of the original Volusia Forever land acquisition process that insulated decisions from political influence, and what role does cost-benefit analysis play in that? There we go. The, the first was just simply process that, that it, before it goes forward, it's, there's a full staff review, usually from different departments uh, on the, and the staff review tracks the objective criteria that's set forth in the resolution. So those things that Kelly mentioned, the environmental uh, aspects, water resources, resource you know management, can it be managed, all those factors. And then it, it would go to the council um, as a group. 
the the procedures that were in place um, were designed uh, so that county council members would not get involved in the process, that they would be there to review the recommendations that come forward. And then the, the vote is, you know, not to move forward on particular particular one, but whether or not something is going to go on the A list, which would authorize staff to go forward to do the negotiations. So, you know, I mean, there, there have been in other counties um, concerns about uh, elected officials getting involved or appraisals uh, being ginned up, uh, you know, or, or, you know, big time contributors to a council member all of a sudden getting a project bought out. Those are the kind of things you want to write into the process so it doesn't happen. And, and, um, and, and that's what we really need here as well. Nancy, can I just add something as a, as a former council member who served during this project? One, one of the things that has to happen to is council, the council members themselves have to respect the process. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've got to understand that, that they're the last people that need to be involved in, this, in, in, in the process of, of, of uh, checking it out, making sure that, all, that it matches all the elements that, that, we were, that Volusia County requires and that they should keep a, a distance from bringing projects forward, you know, speaking, speaking in support that their goal, their role is to let the process work and then make a decision. And council, every council that I served on, I think was respectful of that. Uh, and I think it needs to, you know, for the next 20 years, council members really need to think, think long and hard about where they want to get involved, how, how involved they want to get, what their role is, because it's always been that council has respected that role. And, and let me let me add one, I, you can hear me, right? I can't say whether I've muted or not. Um, there is one role that council can be very effective at and Pat, it was really good at this. And that's, you know, really being a champion for the process and being a cheerleader because sometimes many of these have to be partnerships with other units of government. And it's important to have an elected official you know, standing before the governing board uh, in Palatka or standing before the cabinet in Tallahassee to say we're behind the project. So there is a role, but it's that role and it's not getting involved in negotiations. It's, it's the policy setting role, right? Saying that putting in the implementing resolutions that actually activate these programs, you know, habitat connectivity is important, you know, setting those kinds of policies and then letting, letting the environmental scientists from, you know, the county, the state, the region, federal folks, um, you know, private experts all weigh in to, to contribute to make sure that these are scientifically justifiable um, projects or acquisitions in the case of Volusia Forever. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question. Volusia Forever has a clear project by project cost reporting system, but ECHO does not. Will the new ECHO have a similar reporting system? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand that question, Nancy. There is um, ECHO projects and, and Nancy Maddox can, can confirm they are reviewed annually to make sure that they are meeting the mission that they said they would in their application. Um, I, I'm, that's always been part of the process. Uh, that's ongoing annually through the year. So Nancy, do you wanna? Yeah, once, once the project is complete, um, they are reporting for at least 20 years up to 30 years after the project is complete annually. Um, so, and, and also staff goes out and reviews and makes sure that all the things that are being um, reported is being done. So it's definitely balance, checks and balancers that are done that way. And, and there is some discussion last year whether we needed to reduce that from, what, I can't see, was it 40 years now? One is 40 and one's 30, but they were talking about 20. All talking later. about yeah, reducing that. So it's out the life of the Thank you both for clarifying that. 
Um, um, back to Volusia Forever, um, and, and Kelly, you mentioned this, but why would farmland be considered conserved land? Well, you know, the ultimate crop um, is houses, right? And so uh, the idea is, is that if you purchase a conservation easement from a farmer, from farmland, uh, they get to keep farming and that land will stay in open space in perpetuity. Now they don't have to. So this is a multi-generational program, right? In perpetuity. So what happens if um, the, the mom and pop farmer, um, you know, they wanna retire and you know, what happens with the land? Well, once the conservation easement is purchased, the, the county owns those development rights. And so, uh, the family could donate the land, the family could sell to another farmer, could, you know, could, could still utilize that land in agriculture in perpetuity, but they can't put a development on that property. And there's a lot of development pressure on agricultural properties because it is much less expensive to build on a clean slate, open land than it is to redevelop, sadly. Thank you. Um, so we've outlined how a property is identified for Volusia Forever, but who can nominate the property? Anyone. How's that? Um, I mean, usually, I mean, ultimately, it's a voluntary acquisition program. So the property owner has to be willing to go along with it. But many times, uh, would be you know others like a conservation organization or maybe even a city that comes forward with with the application but uh but anyone can nominate but you still have to have the the, the property owners got to go along um still of uh, volusia forever what percentage of the volusia forever fund is earmarked for land management um, something that came up in the workshop in February 2020 was that some of the land management funding came from the general fund. And would that adjustment to that um, happen in the implementation process or prior to it? That's a policy decision. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know that the council has made that determination. They can and they will and they should. Do we um, know, does Pat know or Kelly know? Well, I, I was just going to add that there, um, that that is that is an item that will be before council for them to decide. It currently it, it's ten percent, and there is some um, comp discussion about going to fifteen percent because there was dollars that were coming out of general fund, uh, and um, I don't know of. I haven't heard of anybody who has been in opposition to that, but that will come after the listening sessions as part of a part of a recommendation. So that it'll it'll be it'll be joint implementation discussion. And it's important to note that this land, I mean, wilderness in effect, you know, has to be managed. I mean, we we don't really have wilderness in per se, but but these these things that we think of as wilderness, these things, these natural lands, they still need some some management they need to be protected like for instance with fences they have to have public access that's appropriate and sometimes limiting some of these properties need to be fire managed others need to have exotic species removed so there are ongoing perpetual obligations to good management of natural lands great thank you and can Go i ahead. just something from from the echo side that's one of the discussions that I think the council is going to have about the trails. The trails set aside right now is a million. I believe they're going to recommend, internally recommend to the council that to continue that million. But I think there is some interest in carving out some of those dollars for um, uh, maintenance of a showcase system. And I'm not talking about the everyday maintenance. I'm talking about you know potholes because you get potholes on trails and. Uh, that kind of stuff and, and making sure that the showcase trails, in fact, a showcase trail with appropriate restrooms and picnic areas and that kind of stuff. So I think you'll also hear some of that 
when it comes to the to echo and the master trails uh, showcase master trails program. Great, thank you. Um, and this is something that Clay mentioned earlier about the Florida Forever money. With the lion's share of Florida Forever uh, money going to South Florida with their algal blooms and the fish kills there, how do we make sure that Volusia gets their fair share? Well, you know, these are political decisions. The legislature makes these decisions. Um, we need to continually stay on top of them to understand that you know, we're going to be short, our taxpayers are going to be shortchanged if, we, if some of that money isn't coming, our fair share isn't coming back here. Um, and yes, you're right. I mean, even um, in, in, the, in the budgets working their way through the system now, there's about, at the best, about four times more money appropriated for South Florida than for the rest of Florida in Florida, in the Florida Forever program. Amendment one's gonna generate a billion dollars this year. You know, even though we've had a recession, we've not, it's not been a real estate recession. So the dollars are there. And what uh, we can, must continue to show our outrage about is use of these dollars for, their, for the unintended purposes. This was about land acquisition, um, adding to Florida forever, protecting our springs, and yes, the Everglades, no question about that. But, um, uh, but you know, it, we, we just need to continually stay on our legislators to make that happen. And in terms of form and function, matching our process to the state processes, you know, if you have um, deadlines for um, applications for these land acquisition programs, I think it would be um, wise to sync those up to ensure that you can actually match those, those dollars. And so having um, folks that work with the county who also are working with the state lands folks and know the different cycles, funding cycles, um, you know, that can, I think really, if we do that strategically, um, that could help us maximize the return back to Volusia County. Great, thank you. Um, an echo question. As an individual citizen, can I reach out to my city to see what projects they're considering and have a discussion about that? Sure. I, that, I would absolutely encourage that. Um, there's also very extensive information on the county website of projects that have already been approved or in, or, and or in process. And as soon as um, the, the uh, actual dates were, were set back because of the election cycle and, and this these two programs. We will be entertaining, uh, after the listening sessions, there will be a call for projects. Uh, and so I would encourage anybody at this point who has an idea about a project that they wanna see, go to their city elected officials, you know, go in public participation. The more people you get excited about something, the better. And um, ask them if, if, you know, would they consider this or would they consider that, whatever the project is. But yeah, it's a very citizen-based process and um, that would be an appropriate thing for somebody to do is to go to the city and encourage them if they see a need. And I'll just put a word in, on, on one idea that I've already heard, um, uh, uh, cross country and track you know, cross country and track field events. And we don't really have a location in Volusia County and perhaps we should take a look at doing something like that. So that will be, those kinds of things will will, will bubble up. But uh, I would also tell you at the listening sessions, at listening sessions from 20 years ago, we actually listed projects. We actually wrote on paper, here's what we wanted to see happen. And you could go back, you, you could go back and, and pull those list and, we did it. I mean, that's what was so uh, so wonderful about Echo is that the people spoke. They said, here's what we think we'd like to see happen. And man, I think we tackled just about all of them and had a pretty good track record. So yes, it's really the people's program. They need to be engaged in it. At the listening right. sessions first and then city commission meetings and county council. Right. That's great. Um, if any of you have anything else you want to chime in on, um, but I think that's a great spot to, to finish with. Um, we're a little bit over time. 
And I want to again thank our panelists um, for your expertise, and I thank all your all of our attendees tonight. And um, a great, great uh, informative meeting. And I want to let you know that we will be putting this up on the League of Women Voters website, which is lwvvc.org. Um, and just give us a couple of days to kind of get that done. And I wanted to let you know there are a couple of other events coming up for the League. Um, on April 6th, we have a hot topic open to the general public, again, virtual from 5.30 to 6.30, and this will be Mental Health Jail Diversion Program, which is fascinating. Um, and it's getting individuals with serious mental illness out of the criminal justice system and into treatment and support services. So it's a very worthwhile uh, event. And then on April 24th, it's our general meeting. That'll happen um, from 10.30 to Saturday, from 10.30 to 12. And the critical role of our courts today, and our speaker will be the Honorable Peggy Quince, she is a former Florida Supreme Court Justice. So I hope you all can uh, join us for those. And again, thank you so much everyone for your time and especially our knowledgeable panelists. We really appreciate your time too. And good night, everyone. <laughs>